Good day. Uh, welcome to House of Adonai. Today we are uh, continuing our series on the Ten Commandments, and we're doing part seven um, of this series. This is actually, um, it was first done April 4th, 2020, but we failed to record it. So wanting to keep uh, the series complete, I am now re-recording this from my home. And so uh, <laughs> bear with me. Um, let's begin. The seventh of this, the seventh commandment is about adultery. Now remember what the first four commandments were. Uh, do not have any other gods before Elohim. Do not make graven images or bow down to them was the second one. Do not take God's name in vain was the third one. And then keep the Sabbath holy was the fourth one. And all four of these are about loving God. And this comes first. The other six commandments are about loving our neighbor. And this comes second. And as Yeshua explained in Matthew 22, all of the commandments and instructions in the Torah can be summarized under these two, loving God and loving your neighbors. In Matthew 22, he said, uh, they, he was asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the Torah? And he said to them, you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. As I said, these two commandments, they kind of summarize all of the 10 commandments and all the other instructions in the Torah. Now, Paul also says in Romans 13, verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So that's what we're saying. The last six are all about loving your neighbor as yourself. You see, loving God is number one, and it's covered by the first four. But the last six are all about loving your neighbors. And all 10 are in a very specific order. The Ten Commandments are more important than the rest of the Torah, as we learned in part one, because they were actually written with the finger of God. God didn't want anyone to misinterpret what he meant by those. But uh, the number one commandment is the most important of the 10, followed by the number two, and then the number three, and so on. So the most important commandment about loving your neighbor is number five, loving your parents, honoring your parents. And then it's followed by number six, thou shalt not murder. And then today we're looking at number seven. And what did we say number seven was? Do not commit adultery. Oh, just what is adultery? Let's see the definition. If you were to look in um, Webster Dictionary, this is what you would find. Voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and someone other than that person's current spouse or partner. Note the word voluntary as opposed to non-voluntary. For example, rape, right, is not, um, would not be considered uh, adultery. So basically, if you are married and have sex with any other person than your spouse, it is adultery, according to man's definition. But, you know, as Christians, we should not be looking in Webster Dictionary to find out what adultery is. We should be looking in God's definition, what he calls adultery. And where can we find God's definition? In his Torah, of course. 
We also can find it in uh, Matthew. But I want you to know, it's not the same as man's definition. Yeshua himself says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that everyone who looks upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away, it is better for you that one part of your body should be destroyed than that the whole body be thrown in Gehenna. Gehenna is the lake of fire or hell. So you see, it's not at all, Yeshua did not have the same definition uh, as uh, the dictionary. It's much more stringent. To God, adultery is not just having sex with someone other than your spouse. But if you lust after another person, God considers that you have already committed adultery in your heart. See how God looks at our heart? Look at 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But Adonai said to Samuel, do not look at the appearance or his structure because I have already refused him, for he does not see a man as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but Adonai looks into the heart. And again in Jeremiah, it says, I, Adonai, search the heart, I test the mind, to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And we see here that God actually rewards every person according to their ways. And on the previous slide, we saw how Yeshua says that if your ways are bad and you're committing adultery, Yeshua says that it leads to Gehenna, it leads to hell. Why? Because sin leads to hell. And we see here in 1 John 3, 4, the definition of sin. Everyone practicing sin also practices lawlessness. Indeed, sin is lawlessness or Torahlessness. If you don't keep or you break the Torah, you're committing a sin. Is adultery in the Torah? Well, yes, it is. It's the seventh commandment that we saw. And it breaking, you know, Breaking any of God's commandments leads to hell. Note, adultery dishonors marriage. Look at Hebrew 13, verse 4. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Note, marriage leads and needs to be honored by all, not just a husband and a wife, but outsiders must know, uh, must know and honor other people's marriage. You know, not interfere. That is uh, not well followed today in uh, in this world. We have all been to weddings, and we know we know off by heart the words. Till death do us part, right? That is supposed to mean that once you make those marriage vows, you are to stay with our spite, your spouse, for the rest of your life. Only death can release us from this commitment. Some say that if your spouse is not very nice to you or they're mean to you, then you can divorce. I'm sad to tell you but that is nowhere in the Bible. If we divorce our spice, our, I keep saying spice, our spouse <laughs> is the spice of my life. But if you divorce your spouse and remarry, God says that we are committing adultery. Did you know that? Look in Romans 7, verse 2 and 3. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, 
But if the husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if she is joined to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. So she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. So only adultery is grounds for divorce, according to, to God. And Yeshua confirms that here in Matthew 5, verse 31-32. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, i.e. adultery, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Did you know that? And did you know that God himself also divorced on grounds of adultery? That you didn't realize, but look at Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6 to 10. Then Adonai said to me, in the days of King Josiah, have you seen that backsliding Israel, what she did? She went up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there she committed adultery. Yet I thought that after she had done all this, she would return to me, but she did not return. Even her unfaithful sister Judah saw it. I noted that when backsliding Israel committed adultery, I sent her away and gave her a certificate of divorce. Adonai divorced Israel. Yet unfaithful Judah, her sister, did not fear. Instead, she also went and committed adultery. It happened that through her frivolous prostitution, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and with wood. What? Committed adultery with stones and with wood? What is he talking about? Well, do you remember the second commandment we looked at? Not to make any graven images and bow down to them? Israel was unfaithful to God and pursued other gods. She was unfaithful in, a, in, in worshiping other gods. And God considers unfaithfulness the same as adultery, and he divorced her on that ground. Paul, on the topic of divorce, said in 1 Corinthians, but to the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she agrees to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if any woman, has a husband who is not a believer and he agrees to live with her, she must not divorce him. Note, it says, I, not the Lord. So it's not in God's instructions for men, but Paul's own opinion on the matter. But basically, he is confirming Yeshua's words that you should not divorce even if you find yourself unequally yoked with an unbelieving spouse. In such circumstances, we are to bring our unbelieving spouse to Yeshua through our love. By love and commitment, they should be won over. You know what? Love conquers all. I really believe that. So, be committed to your spouse no matter what. Only on grounds of adultery does God allow divorce. Look at Malachi 2, verse 16. The man who hates and divorces his wife does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. God hates unfaithfulness. Note, it really it's really interesting how Paul says that a husband needs to love his wife, but a wife 
needs to respect her husband. Look at what Paul wrote in Ephesians 5. In any case, let each of you love his own wife as himself and let the wife respect her husband. How come it doesn't say the wife must love her husband? Okay. Of course, uh, she is to love our, uh, her neighbors as herself. So her husband is her neighbor. The wives are also supposed to love their husbands as themselves. But what Paul is saying here is that men and women are very different. God made us very different, but complementary. Women, they need to be shown love and tenderness by their husbands. But husbands need to be respected and honored as the head of the family. So there are different ways to express love. Now, let's look at a passage in John chapter 8, verse 2 to 11. Some use this passage to say that Yeshua didn't condemn adultery, that Yeshua did away with the seventh commandment. Really? Let's read it together. At dawn, Yeshua came again into the temple. All the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The Torah scholars and Pharisees bring in a woman who had been caught in adultery. After, after putting her in the middle, they say to Yeshua, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of committing adultery. In the Torah, as we saw, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? Now they were saying this to trap him so that they would have grounds to accuse him. But Yeshua knelt down and started writing in the dirt with his finger. When they kept asking him, he stood up and said, the sinless among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he knelt down again and continued writing on the ground. Now, when they heard, they began to leave one by one, the oldest ones first, until Yeshua was left alone with the woman in the middle. Straightening up, Yeshua said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Yeshua said, go and sin no more. Now, people say, because Yeshua said, I don't condemn you, that he did away with the seventh commandment, that we didn't have to, um, it wasn't a sin anymore to commit adultery. We didn't have to stone them. And he, they're, they're saying all these things based on these few verses. Their reasoning is that the Pharisees stated that it is a commandment in the law of Moses to stone adulterers. And it's true. And the Pharisees, they brought a woman caught in adultery to Yeshua, and he did not stone her. And also told her, um, told everyone else not to. Thus God's law and the seventh commandment no longer apply, they say. Now, did Yeshua do away with God's law? What do you think? Then why did he not say that they should put her to death instead of telling her that he did not condemn her? Let's find out. First, what does God's word say about who commits adultery? Let's look in the Torah and see what these Pharisees were talking about. In Deuteronomy 22, it says, if a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, in other words, she's committing adultery, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall put away the evil from Israel. And in Leviticus 20, verse 10, it says also, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. 
severe, you think? Well, this is in God's Torah. And his Torah, his word is perfect. You know, maybe if adulterers were put to death today, there would be a lot who would think twice before committing adultery. Think? So did Yeshua come then to abolish the Torah? Let's look in Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Do not think that I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or seraph shall pass away from the Torah. So he says very clearly here that he did not come to abolish the Torah. So he did not come to abolish the seventh commandment or the penalties at uh, the stoning of the people that are committing adultery. He did not come to do that. Then what? Some teach that John chapter 8, that in that chapter, Yeshua abolished the commandment of stoning. And this, of course, would have Yeshua himself breaking the law of God, thus sinning. Because Deuteronomy 4 verse 2 tells us, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So if Yeshua himself was taking away the seventh commandment or the, the rule about stoning anything out of the Torah, he would actually be breaking the Torah according to Deuteronomy 4 verse 2. And he would then be sinning. Why? Because it says here in 1 John, everyone practicing sin also practices lawlessness. Remember we saw this? Because sin is when you break the Torah. So we must ask, did Yeshua sin? He would not then be the perfect sacrifice. If he took away a single commandment, did away with anything in the Torah, he would have sinned. So did he do that? Was he a sinner? We know, of course, he did not sin. That he was our perfect lamb, our perfect sacrifice for our sins. So, did anyone notice when we read in John chapter 8, did they notice verse 6? Now, they were saying this to trap him so that they would have grounds to accuse him. Why were they doing this? Why did they bring this lady uh, caught in adultery and put her in front of him and said, what do you say? They were doing this to test him, but test him how? How could he fail their test? You know, in bringing the woman to Yeshua and after referring to the law of Moses, they say, but what do you say? In other words, the Pharisees and scribes were attempting to trick Yeshua into doing something contrary to the law of God. And this was their clear motive, where their motive is revealed to us. They said this, testing him that they might have something to accuse him. So the question must be asked, if the Pharisees and the scribes are correct in the fact that this woman committed adultery, and it is also clear to all that the law of Moses commands death, then how do they expect this to be a trap? for Yeshua. What is missing? If Yeshua carried out this sentence, what would be their accusation against Yeshua? Supposedly, if Yeshua does not agree that she should be put to death, and Yeshua is then teaching and practicing against the law of Moses, and that would be sin. The adulterous woman was guilty. And that is why Yeshua said at the end, go and sin no more. We saw that in John 8, verse 11. And in Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5, it says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let's go after other gods, 
whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, like the seventh commandment. Listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. That's it. You see, they were testing Yeshua to see if he was a false prophet and if he would teach against God's Torah. If he had said, no, uh, the Old Testament there, the Torah said we should stone him, but I don't agree. If he had said that, he would have been committing sin and they would have had grounds to accuse him and, and to uh, as a false prophet. And they could have stoned him, put him to death, according to Deuteronomy 13. He didn't do that. He didn't say, no, that's not what he said. Now, by the way, this is the number one reason why Jews reject Yeshua today. You know that? It's because Christians today, they sell Yeshua as the savior, the one that did away with the law of God. And so any Jew that hears that, they say, really, Yeshua, uh, this Jesus that you're talking to me about, he came and he did away with the Torah? Well, then he's a false prophet, according to Deuteronomy 13, because he's trying to seduce us away from the way which the Lord commanded us to walk in. We are to keep his commandments. And so that's why the Jews, they reject uh, Jesus, because Christians say, oh, you poor Jews, you're under the law. You're still keeping the Torah. Jesus came to free us from all that. Right away to say, yeah. I want nothing to do with your Jesus because he's a false prophet. And if you're interested more on that, we made a teaching on our YouTube channel called Christianity. Did Jesus come to start a new religion? Okay, so you can go look that up if you're interested in more. But back to our uh, issue here. Oh, they were testing Yeshua to see if he was the promised Messiah or if he was a false prophet and would teach against God's Torah. And look also what it says in Deuteronomy 18. Adonai said to me, they have done well in what they have spoken. I will raise up a prophet like you for them uh, from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them all that I command him. Now, whoever does not listen to my words that this prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet will die. If Yeshua was teaching against the law of Moses, then Yeshua would fail the test of the Messiah provided in God's law, and he would be defined as a false prophet. Both Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18 here are to be used to determine if a prophet was true or false. And this was the typical process in the first century that they would test him with. Therefore, the scribes tested Yeshua because they were biblically commanded to. And any prophet that deviated from the law of Moses was considered a false prophet and killed as prescribed by the law of Moses. Obviously, we also know that this was not true of Yeshua. He was a prophet like unto Moses. So did Yeshua tell the Pharisees 
that they did not have to keep the Torah in this matter? No, he didn't say that in John 8. So he passed the false prophet test. But there was also a second test, the real trap. Does anyone know why they began to leave one by one? In John 8, let's read 7 to 9. When they kept asking him, he stood up and said, the sinless one among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he knelt down again and continued writing on the ground. Now, when they heard, they began to leave one by one. You know, some say that this shows that only God can judge because no one is sinless. If that was so, that no one could carry out could ever carry out stoning as commanded in the Torah. We are all sinners saved by grace. Amen. The key here is on the next slide. The real reason they were testing Yeshua is in Deuteronomy 17, verse 6 to 7, which the Pharisees conveniently did not bring up. Look what it says. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, a man shall be put to death, but he shall not be executed on the testimony of a lone witness. The hands of the witnesses, the two or three, shall be the first in putting him to death. And after that, the hands of all the people. You must purge the evil from among you. The Pharisees claimed that the woman committed adultery. Yet, we see no evidence of any witnesses standing to condemn her. Thus, that is the trap that the Pharisees were attempting to set up for Yeshua. Though it is true that the woman should be stormed, stoned according to the law of Moses, which is not uh, everything that needs to be considered yet in this matter, but there are requirements and criteria that need to be, be presented to the courts. If there were not two or three witnesses to establish the sin, then there is no case to condemn her to death. In fact, if Yeshua would have carried out the punishment, he would have violated the law of Moses. It would have been murder, and he would not be our perfect sacrifice. Yeshua would have been just as guilty and under the curse of the law as anyone else. And that is why Yeshua said, the sinless one among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. You see, the witnesses would be sinless, but false witnesses would be sinning. You understand? He challenged the sinless, he challenged the witnesses. Okay, let the witnesses throw the first stone. And there were no witnesses and no one could throw the first stone. Another part of the trap is, where is the adulterous man? Remember Deuteronomy 22 that we read before? It said, if a man is found lying with a woman, married to a husband, then both of them shall die the man that lay with the woman, and the woman. So you shall put away evil from Israel. Both are to be put to death, not just one. So where was the man? Would it be right to just stone the woman? They again wanted to trap him with this. He knew that the man wasn't there, and he wouldn't be doing according to what the Torah instructed. Writings in the sand. Have you ever heard teachings about this? I once heard that Yeshua was writing in the sand the sins of the accusers to guilt them so that they would all leave one by one. Or that he wrote, judge not lest you be judged. Really? As we know, we are supposed to judge fellow believers according to God's Torah. And we will never know for sure what he wrote, but my bet is that he wrote Deuteronomy 17 verses 6 to 7, where it says, 
on the testimony of two or three witnesses, a man shall be put to death, but he shall not be executed on the testimony of a lone witness. The hands of the witnesses shall be the first in putting him to death. And after that, the hands of all the people. I bet you that's what he was writing. And they read that and they knew exactly that he was right and they were, they were wrong. So am I saying that we should stone people to death today for committing adultery? No, you need to refer to our teaching on capital punishment. We have it on our YouTube channel. There's a whole process that needs to be followed. While God instituted capital punishment, it was meant to be carried out in a judicial system put in place in the Torah, which we do not have in place today. But, may, but the main conclusion you need to make from John 8 here is that Yeshua did not come to abolish the seventh commandment or the law, but he did condemn adultery. He did. Look what uh, Yeshua said to her, go and sin no more because adultery was sin and she had committed sin. He never said it's okay to commit adultery. No, he says, go and sin no more. That is our teaching on the seventh commandment. And uh, in conclusion, the seventh commandment is do not commit adultery. And you know, God looks at the heart not just at the physical adultery, lusting after someone else, to God, that is considered adultery also. And you know what? Adultery is the only grounds for divorce. God divorced Israel for her adultery. I, I don't know if you all knew that, but hopefully you learned at least this today. And Yeshua did not say adultery was okay. At John chapter 8, where people say, you see, he didn't condemn adultery, he did. He said, go and sin no more. They had set up a trap for him to see if he would follow the Torah as it was written, and he did. They were the ones that were trying to trick him, and uh, he did the right thing. He passed the test. He was our perfect and sinless lamb. Amen? So that is it. For our part seven of the Ten Commandments, I encourage you to watch part eight on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.